Okay, I think I'll go ahead and get started then. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, my name is Joshua Karasak. I'm a winemaking specialist with Anarnas USA. And our presentation today is going to be on Zenith. Uh, I will be presenting on why it's a revolution in tartrate stabilization. Uh, so it should be a good presentation today. Um, just a little bit about how our webinars work if you've never joined one of our webinars before. So there'll be a presentation portion. I'll go through the presentation from beginning till end. After the presentation, we'll have a period where you can ask questions at the question and answer session. So uh, what I ask is that during the presentation, you refrain from using the chat box over on the right-hand side of your viewing pane for questions. Um, you can use it for connectivity issues. If you're having difficulties with the platform, um, you can sort of use that chat box to, for technical support. Um, Michael Falk will be available to help you um, in that chat box. So please use that if you're having technical difficulties. Otherwise, wait until the very end of the question and answer portion to use that chat box. Uh, if people are using the chat box and you're finding it distracting, you can actually close the chat box by collapsing it. There's a little arrow on the left-hand side of the chat box that you can click, and that'll collapse the, the chat box for you there. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, this is going to be a recorded session, so uh, the recording will be available for you after the presentation is complete. Um, also, keep that in mind if you are going to be asking questions for the question and answer session that uh, we will be um, posting this online. So any sensitive information, just just um, you know, save that for another conversation because it's going to be available online uh, at a later time. So we'll go ahead and get started then. So here's the sort of agenda or overview of what I'm going to be discussing today. It's going to be a pretty quick presentation. I'm going to try to just go over and highlight uh, why we would want to use Zenith, um, how to use Zenith, and then some of the testing that's involved um, with, um, with Zenith and what BinQuery Labs offers in terms of services for, um, for testing wines for Zenith use. Before we actually get into the content of the presentation, I have a quick poll question that I'd like to go ahead and put up there. So um, if you wouldn't mind just looking at the poll, um, the question is, what is your primary method for tartrate stabilization? So we have chilling, potassium polyaspartate, which is what we're going to be talking about today, CMC, gum arabic, electrodialysis, or that you don't stabilize your wine at all. And we'll give you guys just a couple of minutes to Go ahead and answer this question. Looks like just a little over half of us have answered so far. Okay, so most of us have answered now, so I'll go ahead and end the poll and here are the results so it looks like chilling is still the most common method for tartrate stabilization um, about 59 percent of us are using chilling to stabilize our wines that's not really a surprise to me we we know that the industry is still using uh, chilling for uh, for the most part kpa we have a couple of people that are using kpa already so that's that's exciting we hope to see that number increase um, over the next you know a uh, few months and maybe over the next couple of years as well. Uh, CMC, so there's still a fair amount of us that are using CMC, 11%. Gum Arabic, electrodialysis at 1%. And then 6% of us are, are not stabilizing our wine at all. So interesting results. Um, I'll go ahead and close the poll and we'll get into the actual presentation. So first off, we're going to go over why uh, we would want to work with Zenith or, or why consider Zenith an option for tartrate stabilization. And I'm going to go through point by point these different aspects. So we'll talk about the innovation behind uh, Zenith and KPA, uh, the performance of the molecule itself compared to um, CMC and other uh, options that are available in the market, the quality aspects and why we'd want to consider moving away from chilling um, in terms of um, the application of KPA, sustainability, which should be at the forefront of a lot of our um, processes because uh, it's becoming uh, growingly more important to um, to consider uh, sustainability in our processes, and then cost effectiveness. Ultimately, we have a bottom line to 
uh, consider when we look at our processes. So we'll, we'll go over the cost effectiveness for the application of Zenith as well. So first point on innovation. So what is Zenith in the first place? Zenith is a range created by an artist USA or by an artist in general. Uh, and what Zenith is, is uh, a range of tartrate stabilizers that are based on a new molecule that we developed, which is called potassium polyaspartate. So we developed this molecule and it's patented um, by an artist. And essentially uh, what potassium polyaspartate or KPA is, is um, it's derived from aspartic acid, which is a natural amino acid that's found all throughout nature. What we do is uh, we heat that molecule to form a polysacinamide. So basically a long string of those uh, amino acids. And then we salify it, which means we, we basically make a salt of that uh, polyamino acid. And that's what potassium polyaspartate is, or KPA. So this is what the molecule looks like here. And what potassium polyaspartate does is it uh, has a tendency to chelate cations. And in particular, it chelates potassium. So it binds to potassium. And what that does is it prevents potassium from being able to interact uh, in the formation of potassium bitartrate. So uh, KPA is a molecule developed by an artist, and Zenith is the range of uh, stabilizers that contain KPA. So I'll be using Zenith and KPA sort of interchangeably throughout the presentation. If I'm talking about Zenith, I'm basically talking about KPA because um, all of the Zenith range contains KPA. We have two versions of Zenith that are currently available on the US market. Um, Zenith Uno, which is used for whites and rosés, and then uh, Zenith Color, which is used primarily for uh, reds. The Zenith Uno is just a solution of uh, potassium polyaspartate uh, with some SO2 as a stabilizer. And the Zenith Color is going to be a blend of KPA as well as a filterable gum arabic. So the KPA and the uh, blend, the Zenith Color is going to be stabilizing the tartrates. And the uh, filterable gum arabic is going to be there to stabilize any unstable color. Um, so we'll talk more about Zenith color in a couple of minutes, but just know that the innovation behind Zenith is that we developed a new molecule specifically for uh, tartrate stabilization, and that molecule has some special features, which I'll be going over. So first thing I want to talk about is performance of, of KPA and Zenith in, in general. One of the trials that we've done uh, looking at extreme conditions, uh, so what we did is some long-term testing, uh, looking at the stability of white and rosé wines. So in this particular trial, we looked at seven unstable white and rosé wines. And what we did is we put them in cold storage at negative four degrees Celsius for three months. So this is a, a very aggressive uh, test because we're putting it in very cold conditions for a very prolonged period of time. What we did is we measured the initial um, uh, conductivity of the wines. And so you'll see in this um, in this table over here on the left, we have the seven different wines. This initial untreated uh, absolute change in conductivity, this is how unstable the wines were. We consider that um, greater than a number of 70 is an unstable wine. So all of these wines were considerably unstable. And then what we did is we tracked these wines uh, over the course of the three months to look at how much precipitate was formed in the wines. So we had a control wine, uh, a control of those seven wines, and we had that same wine treated with uh, Zenith Uno at 100 milliliters per hectoliter, which is the standard dosage rate. And uh, I didn't put any of the Zenith Uno over on this chart over here because it would they would all be basically a straight line uh, at the zero percent precipitate because none of the Zenith Uno wines precipitated any tartrates over the course of that three months. Well, so if you look at some of these other wines, uh, you'll notice that after six weeks, we had basically all of the wines precipitating as much tartrates as they were going to precipitate. Um, so let's just look at a visual of what that looks like. So this is a, the images of the flasks that we used for this test. Um, and on the left is the control, on the right is the treatment with, uh, with Zenith Uno. And you can see that all of the controls had a fair amount of precipitate formed at the bottom of the flask, and that's what we were measuring over the course of the three months while well, all of the Zenith Uno was uh, stable after that uh, period of time. So under very extreme conditions, long-term, um, very cold conditions, the Zenith Uno is able to stabilize a range of different instability levels. 
outside of just the length of time that the uh, KPA or Zenith is able to stabilize the wines, we also would want to consider, let's say, highly unstable wines um, and compare it to other additive methods like CMC. So um, in our lab at Vinquery Labs, we receive a lot of wines that go through um, tartrate stabilization and we do a lot of conductivity measurements. We came across some highly unstable wines in the lab and we wanted to put them to the test with uh, the KPA and with CMC. So we compared uh, at equal dosages of CMC and KPA and these three different wines and we looked at to see whether or not the Zenith is able to stabilize these highly unstable wines. So on the y-axis here we have the absolute change and conductivity. So the higher this number is the more unstable the wine is and we have it presented as an absolute change in conductivity and a percent change. If you're more familiar with the percent change 19.2% is very, very unstable. Um, usually we consider anything above 3% to be unstable. The other way of looking at it is the absolute change in conductivity. Anything greater than 70, again, is considered unstable. So this first wine, CMC, is able to stabilize it pretty well. But you'll notice that with the KPA, it stabilized it even more. So this is a highly stable wine after the treatment with the KPA. We look at wine number two. 30% change in conductivity. This is an extremely unstable wine. This would throw a lot of tartrates if you were stabilizing it uh, through chilling or through any kind of um, method. So you can see 30% change in conductivity with a CMC at 10 grams per hectoliter. We're still not able to stabilize this wine because it's just, it's too unstable. And um, so we would still likely have some formation of crystals if you're using CMC in this case. With the KPA, we're able to drop it down into, um, into a region where it's actually stable. Wine number three, this is even more unstable, 32.7%. Again, with the CMC at the standard dose is 10 grams per hectoliter, it's still out of range where it could be considered unstable, where the KPA is, is stabilizing that wine. So um, KPA is able to stabilize a very, very unstable wines. And so the effectiveness in terms of not only the longevity of the product, but the ability to stabilize uh, the tartrates is, is quite high, even higher than, than CMC. So now that we've talked about the performance or some of the performance aspects of KPA, I'd like to switch to talking about the quality compared uh, between uh, treatments from other um, methods and with the KPA. So one thing to consider if you are doing chilling for your tartrate stabilization uh, is that with chilling, when you when you drop the temperature of the wine down, the solubility of oxygen in that wine becomes higher. So that's an inverse relationship. As you decrease the temperature, uh, you're able to um, solubilize more oxygen in that wine. So over the course of the chilling uh, period, let's say uh, two or three weeks on average, you're going to be able to absorb a lot of oxygen during that period. Um, when you heat up that wine, that oxygen is going to be able to react and you'll lose freshness and you'll basically oxidize the product. So uh, this is one thing to consider is that if you're doing chilling, you are losing quality through oxidation, through loss of freshness, um, and so that's one reason to look to an alternative. And that's one of the reasons why Zenith was developed. Another thing to consider is that through that process of chilling, what you're actually doing is you're removing tartrates from the wine. So you're actually precipitating um, natural acidity in the wine. Um, in some regions like you know most of California, um, acidity is a prized thing because it's often limiting in, in some, uh, some winery and some wines in some regions. So you want to preserve that acidity as much as you can. Uh, so chilling is, is not the best way to do that. You're going to lose uh, some of that acidity through that process. You're going to lose TA um, and titratable acidity uh, when, you, when you chill down a wine. And also think about all these tartrates on the inside of the tank are going to need to be cleaned off. So you're going to need to use hot water, detergents, and um, you know, depending on how much tartrates you can have, you have in the tank, you can have quite a lot of cleanup associated with that. Um, so there's labor involved in that process. Um, there's wine losses involved with the racking from the, from the tank. Uh, so these are all things that we need to consider and, and what we'll be talking about more in terms of cost and, um, and why we would look to alternatives for this method. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes, but just know that quality uh, and from a quality standpoint, I've tasted several different uh, trials where um, we compared an additive uh, treatment to chilling, and every single one of them have shown 
more freshness, greater acidity, and the uh, additive uh, treatment. In this case, that would be like Zenith compared to chilling where it was a little bit more flabby and, and more oxidized. So um, just, just the quality aspect is another thing to consider. Now I'm gonna kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about Zenith color um, because this is another quality aspect that we need to consider in red wines. Um, so this chart over here on the right kind of outlines uh, the relationship between quality perception and color density. So in some unstable um, young uh, red wines, uh, so these wines are being bottled sooner and sooner because uh, the market um, is demanding these wines sooner. And, um, and so wineries are often bottling wines uh, earlier. And so there's a lot more unstable color in those wines. What you don't want is to lose that color in the bottle because one, then you have a, a large plug of color and sediment inside of the bottle. And two, you're actually losing color, which um, this chart shows uh, there's a direct correlation between what is perceived quality and color in the wine itself. So by losing that color, you're losing some metric of quality from the consumer uh, perspective. And also what you're doing is you're introducing a lot of sediment in the bottle, which could be um, kind of displeasing for the um, customer when they open the bottle. So just another factor to consider. Here's what an unstable red wine uh, looks like from a testing perspective. So on the left here, we have a wine which, if we look at the conductivity measure, is at 89, so that's above 70. Uh, that wine we would consider unstable for tartrates. And what we did is we subjected this, um, this wine to six days at negative 4C. That's a pretty aggressive color test. So we're looking at color and tartrate formation with this test. Typically, if we were looking at just color, we would do 24 hours at negative 4C, but with this test, we did six days. And you can see that there's a intensity reduction. So what, what we do is we measure the color intensity before and after this treatment. And there's a 10% reduction in color intensity with this, uh, with this treatment. So what this basically shows is that you have a potential to lose color in this wine over the course of aging. And if you lose that color, you might be losing as much as 10% of your, of your color, which is um, a, a pretty substantial amount. And not to mention, if you can imagine this plug of color and tartrates inside of the wine at the, um, you know, after bottling, there's a lot of sediment involved there. And that could be, again, just a little bit of a detractor from the quality of the, of the product. So Zenith Color, we, the same wine was treated with Zenith Color and subjected to the same treatment. And you can see that um, there's no sediment formed, no, no color, no tartrate precipitate. And so this wine is, is considered stable. So that's the benefit of Zenith Color is that you can, uh, in red wines, you can stabilize the tartrates as well as the color. So now we're gonna kind of shift gears a little bit and start talking about the sustainability aspect of, uh, of using Zenith and using KPA. So this group called Stabby Wine, which was formed in Europe, uh, is, was basically established from universities, uh, wineries, institutions. Um, an artist was also involved in this group uh, and basically, what this group was uh, was looking at is the sustainability of the different methods for tartrate stabilization. So there was a lot of collaborative um, work done here between all of these institutions and, um, and also in conjunction with wineries to investigate the sustainability of the different practices for tartrate stabilization. So the data I'm gonna be sharing with you is a result of the work that was done for this project. And what I'm going to be sharing with you after the webinar is the report that was generated from the work done on this project. Uh, and that report includes uh, all of the data and all of the information involved uh, with this project. So if you're interested in the sustainability aspect for uh, tartrate stabilization and you wanna look heavier into uh, the data that was collected for this project, um, we will be sending that to you. It'll, it'll be a PDF in the, in the email after this webinar. So keep your eyes out for that. So first thing we'll consider is energy usage through the different processes. The processes we'll be considering are uh, KPA or Zenith, manaproteins, CMC, gum arabic, resins, electrodialysis, and chilling. And uh, what was looked at here with this, uh, uh, basically this data uh, is the energy usage, which translates to production of CO2. Uh, so with climate change being on everyone's mind, and considering the uh, sustainability of the wine industry, 
we need to be considering the amount of CO2 that's generated from our processes. Uh, and one thing that can be contributing to CO2 is energy usage. So uh, this is broken down into different categories. So energy used, equipment, additives, processing aids, and coadjuvants. All of these, all of these can basically requiring some amount of energy that translates to CO2. So you can see chilling is the highest production of CO2, the least sustainable method for uh, tartrate stabilization. So this is one of the reasons why we're looking to alternatives um, because chilling is such a uh, an energy drain. Um, and when we compare chilling to any of the other methods, uh, additive methods here on the top, or subtractive methods such as resins or electrodialysis, chilling is clearly the loser when it comes to uh, CO2 production or energy usage. Um, so just another factor to consider. And that energy use will also translate to cost effectiveness, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes as well. So water usage, um, particularly in dry regions where water might be more scarce, um, that scarcity is only going to continue to grow over time um, as population increases and as industry continues to grow, um, we need to consider that water usage may become limiting at some point. And so as an industry, we need to try and limit as much as we possibly can the use of water um, to, you know, again, further our sustainability in the, um, in the, um, in the industry. So when we consider KPA, metaprotein, CMC, and gum arabic, we're all basically at the same amount of water use, which is the amount of water used to rehydrate the product itself um, before being added into the wine. So it's pretty low, um, pretty low water usage there. Uh, resins require a little bit more water because there's a flushing step in uh, when you're using uh, resins for ion exchange. Electrodialysis is probably the highest in terms of water use. This uh, metric will, will change depending on whether or not there's a reverse osmosis uh, device involved in conjunction with the electrodialysis machine. Um, but in general, electrodialysis is, is the most water usage of the group. And chilling, the water usage here is related to uh, what's required to clean a tank after you've done the chilling uh, process. And so with all of these additive methods, we are not having to clean the tank after um, in, because we're not basically removing any tartrates, whereas with chilling, you do have to clean the tank afterwards uh, because you're precipitating those tartrates. And so that's that's where the water usage is coming there. For cost effectiveness, um, again, if, if we're considering why we want to look to alternatives, uh, cost effectiveness is always a, um, a concern. Uh, KPA is, is the most cost effective of any of these uh, methods for tartrate stabilization. Uh, it's less expensive than resins, gum arabic, CMC, electrodialysis, manoproteins, and chilling. Chilling is the most expensive process um, out of all of them. Uh, the costs involved there, it, again, you can look at the details in the Stabby Wine document that I'm including, but it's broken down by the labor involved and with racking a tank after chilling and cleaning the tank, costs involved with wine losses from the racking, uh, costs involved from the energy used to chill down the tank. Um, and so those are some of the costs associated with that. Manoproteins is arguably the, the second most expensive. Uh, there's other benefits to using manoproteins besides just the tartrate stabilization. People add them for mouthfeel and for improvement of, of the quality and sensory purposes. So the cost there is a little bit more expensive, but you're getting other benefits from that. Electrodialysis, uh, there's usually a, a large upfront cost with electrodialysis, which decreases over time uh, and use, but there's just a, a little bit of a hurdle to get over with those machines in terms of, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's usually over a couple hundred thousand dollars of the initial investment. CMC, gum arabic, uh, we're looking at uh, just the cost of the product itself. Resins is a less expensive option, um, but there are some things to consider there in terms of quality of the product produced changes in pH, et cetera. And then again, KPA is, is gonna be the least expensive option out of those, uh, out of that group. So now that I've broken down why we might wanna consider using Zenith, um, I'm gonna explain a little bit about how to use Zenith and um, how it's applied. So Zenith is applied um, just before bottling. 
Um, it's applied to a wine that has below two NTU, so you don't want turbidity in the wine when you add the zenith. Uh, the reason for that is that um, zenith or any additive colloid that you use can interact with turbidity in a wine, and through that interaction with the turbidity, you can lose effectiveness of the product. Um, and so you want to add it to a wine that is um, basically clear below two NTUs. We recommend preparing the wine uh, for Zenith. So what that involves is bentonite fining trials for the use of Z uh, with Zenith. Uh, this is these are trials that can be done at Vinquery Labs. And essentially, what that does is it looks at the protein stability of the product. Um, because if you have unstable proteins in the wine, those proteins can interact with the zenith and you can lose effectiveness and potentially form a haze in the bottle if you're not careful. So it's very important that when you have a, a um, protein stable wine when you're using zenith, which usually isn't an issue because most people are protein stabilizing their white wines anyways. So you need to have a protein stable wine. And in general, uh, you need to have a wine which is a little bit more protein stable than typical heat stability requires. And it usually ends up being about half a pound per thousand or a pound per thousand more uh, to prepare it for the use with Zenith. So we recommend doing bentonite finding trials for Zenith through Vinquery Labs. And it's usually like a, it's like an extra $20, I think, on top of our normal bentonite finding trials for us to do that. But that is a crucial uh, part of the process because what it does is when you get to the point where you're doing your Zenith testing, so when you're testing your wines for compatibility with Zenith, it prepares the wine for that test such that you won't have to go back and add any additional bentonite, um, which can slow down the process and just be a little bit of a headache for winemakers. So I do recommend the bentonite finding for Zenith. It'll help expedite the process uh, much greater than just doing regular bentonite finding trials oftentimes. And so again, the product is added just before bottling. Um, you add it to a wine which is low turbidity and uh, has passed the testing from Vinquery Labs for the Zenith panel. Uh, and then it's basically added and you're good to go. Uh, Zenith or KPA has no impact on filterability. So you'll notice in this uh, graph right here, we're looking at filterability index compared to a control and those lines are right on top of each other. Uh, KPA is extremely low viscosity. So um, it's a very, very filterable. So you're not gonna encounter any filterability issues, which some versions of um, CMC or, or other gums can can sometimes cause difficulties with uh, filterability and uh, you're not going to encounter those issues with the use of Zenith and particularly Zenith Uno which is just the pure KPA. So uh, here are some of the uh, panel offerings by uh, Vinquery Labs. Um, we Again here's the bentonite finding trial for Zenith. That's something I recommend for all whites and rosés. It's going to make your process so much easier and it's it's just going to be um, the way to go and that's what i recommend before every wine is treated with zenith you need to do a zenith uh, panel so there's a zenith panel for whites and rosés there's a zenith panel for reds and there's a zenith panel for sparkling wines with whites and rosés uh, we check the tartrate stability of the product with zenith uno and we check the uh, colloid stability to ensure that you're not going to have any negative interactions between the zenith and your wine so this is a critical step in the winemaking process when you're using Zenith. And I, I would say that it is a requirement for, uh, for your wine to ensure that you have tartrate stabilization and colloid stability with the product. With Zenith, we're looking uh, at Zenith color use and reds. We're looking at the color stability and we're looking at the tartrate stability with that product. With Zenith for sparkling, we have two versions of that. I didn't include it in this table, but we have two versions of it. We have one for traditional method and one for Charmant. The traditional method looks at um, doesn't look at the colloid stability because that's not as important for, for traditional method wines uh, and for base wines in particular. The um, sparkling panel for Charmant, uh, we look at colloid stability. So you wanna make sure that you are have a protein stable base wine when you're using Zenith in those products. Uh, so that's the difference between those two, uh, two different panels uh, for, for sparkling wines. So just a, a little bit of a teaser. Um, so I've gone through the, the application of the Zenith Uno, the Zenith Color, um, but we do have some exciting new products that we'll be uh, including uh, within our range uh, fairly soon. Uh, the Surly KPA. So this is a product that's intended for uh, aging use with KPA. 
So that's a little bit of a different application. And again, uh, that's something that's gonna be coming soon and we'll be excited to introduce that product um, to the market. But for now, I'm just sort of introducing uh, the idea that we will have more products containing the KPA because it's such a useful tool. We also have the Stab Seal K Plus, which is our, um, our mana protein stabilizing agent uh, that has a little bit of KPA included in it. So that'll be the Stab Seal K Plus with KPA. Uh, so those are two products that will be coming soon to um, to an artist, and we will introduce those products when they become available. But I'm just sort of um, introducing them to you now, just to sort of um, uh, let you know that they're coming. And that pretty much does it for our presentation today. Um, I hope the information that I presented was useful um, in terms of your understanding of the the use of KPA and uh, all of the different uh, aspects to the, the product itself. Uh, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna open up uh, for question and answers. So the chat box on the right hand side will be the place that we can do that. Um, I'll go ahead and open up that chat box now. Okay, so um, we're entering the question and answer mode now. If you type in your questions, I'm happy to go ahead and uh, take those questions and I'll go ahead and um, go ahead and answer them as they come. So Casey DeCesar is asking first, can you comment on the changes of haze formation in a red? So haze formation in a red, uh, I, I, I guess you're probably talking about color um, interactions. Uh, you can form some hazes in red wines, uh, either through iron casts uh, or through the formation, let's say in, in some North American hybrids where there's less tannin, you might have a protein haze that can form in a red wine. Uh, that's not very common in vinifera varieties because there's not a lot of protein in, in viniferas. Um, but in some North American hybrids, you can form those kind of interactions. Um, most haze formation though is in the form of a sediment because in red wines, you just have so many phenols and so many other uh, materials that generally you'll form a precipitate before you'll form a haze. Um, sometimes you can have hazes form and red wines because settling is not uh, efficient, either through um, either if you have pectins or glucans present. That might be the reason why, why you'd have a haze. Um, but in general, those are the those are the things that you would see in a red wine with haze. With the zenith color, what we're really going for is protection of the color uh, precipitation and protection of the tartrate uh, formation, which are both important. So Robert Campbell is asking, what's the dosage? So the dosage, uh, standard dosage for Zenith Uno is 100 milliliters per hectoliter. For the Zenith Color, it is 200 milliliters per hectoliter. So that, those are the two standard dosages. Uh, those are gonna be in, on the TDS sheets, which you can find on our website. Uh, those TDS sheets include all of the information about the use uh, of the Zenith. And I do recommend looking over those um, if you are going to be using the, the Zenith. Patrick Hale is asking, is it compatible with Stab Micro? Absolutely. Um, Stab Micro usage will not affect uh, the Zenith. Typically, Stab Micro is used over the course of fermentation and aging. Uh, since Zenith is applied at the end of the process before bottling, um, you're not going to have any interaction uh, between the two molecules anyway, uh, but there's no interaction between Stab Micro and, and Zenith. Danielle Lafayette asks, what is the shelf life of a wine with KPA? So, so far we have testing of up to five years. Uh, that's as long as the molecule has been around. Uh, we have long-term testing of up to five years and the KPA is completely stable. Uh, we have other testing that we've done to predict the shelf life stability of KPA, comparing metatartaric acid, comparing CMC. And what we do is to predict the stability of the molecule over time, we apply heat. Uh, because heat can basically predict whether or not the molecule is stable. Uh, with metatartaric acid, you see that the application of heat deteriorates the uh, ability of the molecule to stabilize wine. Um, with KPA, we do not see that at all. So the application of heat does not affect uh, the stability of the KPA, and the wine uh, remains stable after the application of the heat with the KPA in it. So um, while we only have five years at this point, we suspect that it'll be stable for much longer than that. Um, and so we're, we're confident that the longevity of the product is, is quite good. 
Kyle Loudon asks, what is the procedure to follow for Zenith after potassium carbonate addition to reduce acidity? Um, so what I recommend, if you're gonna be applying Zenith, or you're gonna be applying any additive colloid is you get as far along in the process as possible uh, before you do your testing of the wine for Zenith use. So that includes all of your adjustments for fining, uh, all of your adjustments for sugar, any major adjustments you're gonna make to the wine, you need to make all of those adjustments before you submit the wine uh, for a Zenith panel to ensure that there's not gonna be any uh, changes to the wine matrix um, after the testing is done. So you need to do all of those things before uh, you do the Zenith panel. If there's an if there's any issue with the wine um, and, and, and the interaction between the wine and the Zenith, we will elucidate that through the testing with uh, the Zenith panel. So that's why it's critical that all the major adjustments are made to the wine before that uh, testing. You don't have to have a filtered wine at the point when you submit for the Zenith panel. We do filter every single wine before doing the Zenith panel anyways. Um, so that's not an issue. You don't want to filter a wine before you add the Zenith, but uh, in terms of submitting the wine for the Zenith panel, it does not need to be filtered. So uh, no issues with using potassium carbonate in the wine, um, but you just want to make sure that you make that adjustment before you submit for the Zenith panel and certainly before you add the Zenith. And Janelle is asking, how do wines taste with Zenith? So there is no sensory impact with the use of Zenith. Uh, from the Zenith Uno and Whites and Rosés, there's no sensory impact. Um, with the Zenith Color, you do have a little bit of a sensory impact because there is a filterable gum Arabic included in that blend. But the filterable gum Arabic tends to introduce softness and a little bit of body to red wine. So it's generally, um, I mean, winemakers add filterable gum just for the actual mouth um, mouthfeel improvement. So, um, but that's what you'll expect. You, you should do bench trials with the Zenith, both the Uno and the color for yourselves to see the effect. Um, but we have not, uh, there's no sensory uh, impact with the use of the Zenith Uno on whites and rosés. And on uh, with the Zenith color, there's just a little bit of an impact on the mouthfeel, but it's generally a positive uh, impact. And Pros asked, did an artist conduct trials on Pinot Noir for red wine and Pinot Noir for rosé? Uh, was the color stable for in the long term? Uh, so we do have trials with Pinot Noir for uh, red wine color stability. Um, those wines were stabilized with the use of the Zenith color. For Pinot Noir for Rosé, uh, same thing. We've done plenty of testing with the Zenith Uno on Rosé. And there's no impact with the KPA on color. So the KPA is um, unlike CMC. CMC does interact with unstable color. KPA does not interact with unstable color. So and rosé, it works perfectly. In red wines, you can use the Zenith Uno, but we do recommend the Zenith color just because of the color stability aspect. And then was the color stable for long-term? I'll have to look to see if we have uh, the data for long-term uh, color stability, but I suspect that it's going to be a long-term effect. Um, the gum arabic does not really deteriorate over time, and the KPA we know is, is stable as well. So I can try and find that data for you, Anna. If you email me, I will, um, I'll try and dig that up for you. Scott Steingraber asks, we've had problems with red wines when CMC was added in the chunky, uh, chunky haze forms, anything with Zenith. So uh, if you are using a red wine that has protein and stability, that could be a consideration. That's why we recommend doing the uh, Zenith color panel um, because we would be able to see that almost immediately with the use of the product. Um, you typically would only see a protein haze form if you had unstable proteins and you were using, let's say, non-vinifera uh, sources of color or non-vinifera wines. So that's why the Zenith color panel is so important to predict those things. Um, but in general, you shouldn't have those difficulties with red wines because there's most red wines don't have any proteins. Um, but again, if you do the Zenith uh, panel for color, you would never see um, that issue because we would be able to predict that. Um, with CMC, you might have, again, interactions with unstable red color. With Zenith, we don't have those interactions, so it's it's a, a better product for that reason. Molly Han uh, Haycock asks, with regards to label information, is Zenith considered gluten-free, organic, vegan? It is not uh, organic. I believe it is vegan, and it is gluten-free. Uh, so I believe it is... is um, it is plant derived. 
So it is, uh, I believe, vegan, but I'll have to uh, double check on that. Um, and then in terms of organic, we uh, we haven't gotten organic certification on it, um, but we can look into um, the governing bodies in terms of the CCOF to find out if um, if that can be approved for organic wine. So uh, if you send me an email after this, Molly, uh, then we can uh, we can we can talk about that further. Haley Sykes asks for the performance long-term extreme condition slide wines one through seven. Were the control wines stabilized at all, i.e. chilled? Uh, no, they were not uh, stabilized through chilling. Uh, the purpose of that trial was to look at, one, if the wines were going to precipitate tartrates in their, in their typical state. And then two, was the Zenith able to prevent those tartrates from forming in those wines over that period of time? So it wasn't a it wasn't necessarily a chilling versus Zenith trial. It was a can Zenith stabilize a wine under extreme conditions trial. Um, so those wines were not chilled before the before the trial began. Connor Russell asks, in the trial, you showed seven unstable wines. Comparing with and without Zenith, what was the dosage rate used in the bench test? That was 100 milliliters per hectoliter. So that was our standard dosage. Tim Wilson asks, hi, Joshua, can you comment on whether Zenith requires the same level of heat or colloidal stability that CMC requires? We have found that CMC requires two to five pounds per thousand more bentonite than just heat stability. So Zenith is less interactive with wine proteins compared to CMC. That's another benefit of Zenith. We've done side-by-side -side trials comparing the amount of bentonite required for the use of Zenith and the use of CMC. And Zenith is oftentimes a pound uh, per thousand more than the heat stability test and oftentimes much less than the CMC. So that's another benefit to using uh, the Zenith over CMC. Um, and if you're seeing levels that high, five pounds per thousand more bentonite than uh, just regular heat stability, I would uh, consider looking at the pectin and glucan levels of those wines. Uh, what we found is that wines that are having that kind of negative interaction with CMC typically have very high pectin or glucan levels. Uh, and that can affect the way that the um, bentonite is preparing a wine for the use of CMC. So um, I would just recommend looking at those things next time that you uh, do a test like that. Ken Safford, what preparations are needed for red wine and Zenith color? Um, same in terms of turbidity, you wanna have below two NTUs, make all of your adjustments in terms of fining, uh, clarification, all of those things ahead of time and then submitting that wine for um, for the Zenith panel. All of those things will prepare your wine for the use of Zenith color. Um, with, with red wines, I do recommend looking at the filterability of the wine beforehand, uh, because while the Zenith color doesn't affect strongly the uh, filterability of the product, um, I, I oftentimes recommend that people look at the filterability to make sure that the wine is filterable to begin with, um, because we have had instances where uh, people complain about a colloid affecting the filterability of the product, um, but we actually find that the product is not filterable even with the uh, the use of the colloid. So those are things that we typically recommend uh, for red wines. In particular, if you've had filterability issues with a, a wine in the, in the past, we recommend just checking the filterability of that product because pectins and glucans are a huge enemy of filterability, and oftentimes winemakers don't look at them and sometimes that's the biggest factor when they consider filterability. So pectins and glucans, I oftentimes will check those uh, to see if the wine is gonna be filterable as well. Brian Shaw mentioned, uh, says, you mentioned Zenith Uno has no filterability issues, but the slide says to add Zenith Uno you know, post-filtration. Does it make a difference if it's added uh, before or after filtration? So the Zenith Uno is not gonna impact the filterability of the product. Um, but if you add it to a wine that has turbidity, what can happen is that the turbidity can interact with the KPA and you can lose effectiveness of the KPA by that um, binding to some of the turbidity in the wine. Um, so typically if you're gonna be doing the Zenith panel on a wine uh, that's post-filtration and you're adding it pre-filtration, then you can have some, uh, some difficulties with, with that. So we just recommend adding it uh, post-filtration just because you know, why not do it at that point anyways? Um, and you're not going to lose uh, some of the uh, some of the effect of the KPA through interactions with the turbidity in the, in the wine. 
So that's that's one of the reasons for that uh, for that application. Although we do know that the Zenith Uno is extremely filterable. Randy Graham asks, what is the best wine temp for KPA additions? So KPA additions at low temperatures is totally fine. Um, we had a lot of winemakers ask us that question. Um, with some of the gums, uh, you have like, let's say CMC or gum Arabic, you have a product that's more viscous. Uh, so at lower temperatures, it becomes harder to dissolve that more viscous product in the wine. With KPA, it's extremely low viscosity. So you don't have that difficulty with lower temperatures. I mean, obviously adding it at warmer temperatures makes it easier to mix in, um, but at lower temperatures, you don't have that same difficulty. So you can add uh, KPA or, or Zenith at um, very low temperatures with, without any difficulties. Wayne Brown asks, how does it impact calcium tartrates? So calcium tartrates are not affected um, positively from uh, KPA. Um, we, we know that there's not really a negative impact on calcium tartrate formation as well. Uh, so no impact on calcium tartrates at this point. Um, we're continuing to test wines uh, for calcium tartrate formation with the use of Zenith. But so far we have seen no uh, negative interaction uh, between uh, the use of Zenith and calcium tartrate formation in wines. Boyd Shermas asks, if not finding red with bentonite, is Zenith testing appropriate? Um, yes, I think Zenith testing in, in any wine is appropriate and, and necessary uh, for, uh, for the production of the wine. Robert Campbell asks, what's your thought on rosé that has been treated with bentonite at press harvest? Should it need more bentonite fining to use this product? Uh, that's something that just requires testing, Robert. I can't answer that question without looking at the numbers in terms of how protein stable that wine is. So that's something that just requires um, to to do the uh, the analysis to test the colloid stability of the product um, with the Zenith. So um, I always just recommend doing the testing. It'll cost you a little bit of money. It's, it's really a small amount of money, though, for the amount of um, security that you're getting with the use of the product. Um, the worst thing that you want to do is trade one instability for another. And because there can be a negative interaction with the proteins, we just recommend testing it. You'll have peace of mind and it'll, you'll be preparing the wine uh, better. Corey Garner says, can you make a final small pre-bottling SO2 adjustments with the addition after adding Zenith? I don't see that as being an issue, um, Corey, but the easiest way to, to predict that is to just spike a wine with the amount of SO2 that you expect to add before submitting it for the Zenith panel. Um, so that's the best way to prepare for that. But I don't see it as being a major issue, particularly because uh, Zenith comes in a very high concentration of SO2. Um, and when you add the Zenith, you're, at, you're actually adding a small amount of SO2 through that addition as well. So I don't see it as being an issue, but if you are concerned about it, you could always make a small adjustment to the wine before submitting it for the panel. Paul O'Neill asks, should I continue using Seligum LV20 or switch to the Zenith? Wine is a hybrid, uh, red Norette. Um, I think if you're using the LV20 on a, on a hybrid, you should absolutely look at switching to Zenith, um, particularly the Zenith Color or even the Zenith Uno, you could use either of those two. Um, and the best way to, to um, you know, look at that is to, again, do some testing on the wine to make sure it's compatible. Um, but I, yeah, I believe that if you were using this LV20, Certainly the, um, the KPA or the Zenith Uno is gonna be an upgrade from that because you can have some interactions with the CMC and unstable uh, red wine color. Lydia Cummins asking, can it be used in unfiltered wines if they are below 2NTUs and protein stable? Um, yes, the answer to that is yes. Um, but again, you should do testing on it just to assure that you're not gonna have negative interactions um, that's, I guess, I guess that's um, sort of the underlying uh, theme here is, is just to test the wine first. That'll make sure that the, the product's going to be uh, able to be compatible with it. Um, but yes, I suspect that you should, that you would be able to do that. Tim Wilson's asking, hi, Joshua, can you comment on whether Zenith requires the same level? I think we already answered that question. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip past that one. 
Paul's asking what's the difference between Seligum, LV20, and Zenith. Different molecules. Uh, again, LV20 is, is going to be more filterable than the Zenith, or going to be more filterable than other uh, CMCs, but the Zenith is more filterable than the LV20, so um, that's one more benefit. Uh, other than that, it's the level of tartrate stabilization that you're getting from the Zenith compared to CMC, um, and that's, that's really the two big uh, factors, as well as if you're using it for red wines in particular, LV20 and other CMCs can interact with uh, with unstable color. Um, if you had that in a rosé or a red wine, you might have a difficulty with the CMC. With Zenith uh, Uno, you do not have that difficulty. Is bentonite finding required for the use of Zenith color in a red wine? Um, that might depend on how unstable the color is in that wine. I've seen some very, very, very densely colored red wines that are practically black um, that still were not able to sta be stabilized with the amount of Zenith color in a standard dosage. And the best way to predict that is, again, to do the testing on it. If we go through the testing and we find that there's just still too much color in the product and that you're still getting precipitate to form, then you can do a light bentonite finding to, uh, again, prepare the, the wine for the use of the Zenith color. And again, that's going to depend on if you're using a vinifera or a, um, or a North American hybrid, because again, the hybrids have high protein levels and low tannin levels, which uh, again, you can still have some unstable proteins in the red wine. So I just recommend if you have those unstable proteins, um, do the testing. The testing will elucidate that issue if there is one, and we can make a recommendation after that part, that point. Maddie Whelan, is it approved for use in Canada? Uh, it is, it actually is approved for the use of Canada. So you're all good there. Oh, and uh, Mike went ahead and posted the response there. So, okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm taking that back now. I thought that it was approved in Canada, but it looks like we're still waiting to hear from Health Canada as to whether or not it's approved. So we should be hearing early March to mid-April uh, on that. So I apologize. That's that's my um, my bad. Um, so yeah, that one we're still waiting out for approval in Canada. So Brandy's asking, is it under the two, uh, 24246? It's under the 24250 right now. Um, it's so the TTB currently is reevaluating the list for the 24250, and it's probably going to move in be moving some products from the 24250 to the 246, but currently it is listed on the 24250, and we don't suspect that it will be moving to the 24246 in this next round of considerations. So uh, if we if you wanted it to be considered for uh, the 24246, I would consider writing a letter to the TTB just to request that. Um, if, if the TTB receives a lot of requests from the industry for that purpose, they will consider it faster for that, uh, for that approval. Um, but right now it's, it is on the 24250, so approved for domestic use in the United States with some consideration for export to countries that also have it approved, which at this point is most of the countries in the, in the world, except for China. Um, but currently the 24250, so uh, it's, it's approved for domestic use. Sarah Hall asks, what is the maximum rate you can add? The 100 milliliters per hectoliter recommended dosage uh, is the maximum uh, addition rate. So that's 10 grams per hectoliter of KPA. And the Zenith Uno is a 10% solution of KPA. So 100 mils per hectoliter, our standard dosage is the maximum rate. Um, originally, the uh, FDA had said that um, they would consider 30 grams per hectoliter, but the TTB only approved 10 grams per hectoliter. And we don't really know why, but that's that's what they've um, that's what they've approved. So, Hayden Moyne's asking, with traditional sparkling wine and from uh, bottle fermentation, and having added zenith just prior to bottling for tirage, do you see a drop in zenith with extra colloids that are produced in the bottle and then disgorged? Definitely, if you have unstable proteins and turbidity in that wine, you will lose some of that effectiveness of the zenith. And it's a similar process if you're using CMC. Um, how much that drop is, is going to be related to the protein stability level of the wine, how much proteins are in there, um, how much turbidity that's that's related to um, things other than yeasts are available in the wine. So th that's something that, again, is 
wine dependent. So the safest method is to protein stabilize the base wine before going into tirage and the, and the addition of Zenith. Some winemakers don't like to do that because you lose a little bit of foamability with the loss of the proteins. Um, but you can also add back proteins in the form and different forms too. And also through gums to try and boost that, those, um, that foamability. So the safest method is to remove the proteins ahead of time, but we understand that a lot of winemakers want to work, um, with those proteins, uh, maintaining those proteins. So, uh, that is an option to add it to those uh, base wines, but you may lose some of the, um, stabil stabilization through the tirage process. So that's why we recommend, uh, testing it after tirage. If you are using the Zenith, just to ensure that you do have a tartrate stable wine. If you need to make any adjustments at the end of the process, you can use a little bit more Zenith in the dosage, uh, or you can use uh, a little bit more, um, let's say, uh, Citragum or something like that in the dosage to just make some final adjustments. Because I suspect you'll lose a little bit of effectiveness, but I suspect the wine will, will probably most, be mostly stable at the end of tirage anyways. So uh, just food for thought. Hayden asks, what compound does KPA bind to? It is binding to potassium primarily. Um, if you have other turbidity in the wine, let's say, um, you know, uh, sort of grape material like uh, pulp or, you know, other things floating around the wine, you can have some binding of the KPA to those things. Um, but if you have a wine that's clear in terms of low NTUs, the KPA is primarily binding to potassium. Wayne Brown says, would you not recommend KPA for non-vinifera? Uh, no, I think non-vinifera is okay. You just want to do testing first to make sure that you don't have interactions with the wine. Vinifera, non-vinifera reds in particular, which have low tannin. Uh, if you haven't made any tannin additions to the fermentation, you may still have unstable proteins present in the wine, which can have negative interactions. Uh, so it's, again, just if you do the testing, that'll elucidate whether or not the KPA is uh, able to be used with non-vinifera. Um, but it's it's the same with any additive colloid and non vinifera Sarah Hall is asking, can you provide the test procedures for us to conduct on our panels? I don't believe we're offering uh, the testing procedure from a uh, colloid stability standpoint. I think that's a, a proprietary method, so I can't share that with you, Sarah. Um, the method that we're doing for testing on the conductivity uh, aspect is just a mini contact test uh, with and without the uh, Zenith included. Um, so if you wanted to talk about procedures, you could certainly call the lab and ask them to share that, uh, that information, but I don't believe I, I can share it with you uh, right now on this webinar. So my apologies for that. Tim Wilson, for sparkling rosé, do you recommend the Zenith sparkling panel or the Zenith color panel? Uh, Zenith color panel is for is for red wines. So for rosés, if it's a really darkly colored rosé, then you might want to do a Zenith color panel. But I suspect in a rosé, most of the color loss that you're going to have is through oxidation rather than unstable color precipitating. So for for sparkling rosé, I would recommend the um, Zenith sparkling panel. What is your turnaround time for testing panels needed for Zenith Uno? It's same day testing. So if you drop off a sample, if we get a sample in the morning, you'll have the, um, the results the same day. Hayden's asking, can you add Zenith Uno to the dosage liqueur if it wasn't added at bottling to tirage for traditional sparkling wine? Yes, you can absolutely do that. Um, some people had concerns about the SO2 concentration of a dosage affecting the ability of the KPA to be in the dosage. The KPA comes in a very, very high SO2 solution. So I don't suspect that the dosage is going to be a problem from an SO2 standpoint. Um, and there are producers currently right now in uh, Italy making Prosecco that have, we, they have treated uh, millions of hectoliters of Prosecco and they use it in the dosage and they have not had difficulties. So you can do that. Uh, we do recommend still doing testing to ensure that it's going to be um, you know, appropriate for the use of the dosage. With that, you would probably do a um, a Zenith uh, panel for for um, either a Zenith Uno panel or a Zenith Sparkling for traditional method panel. Could this product be used in white wines that have not been treated with bentonite? Uh, if the if the product is protein stable, 
then uh, that's a possibility. Uh, most wines that are not protein stable are, um, that could be problematic. Uh, there is some considerations for, um, for treating wines with Zenith in aging. Uh, that has not yet been done to a large uh, scale. Um, the potential for the uh, Surly KPA might help with that. But at this point, we are not recommending using white wines uh, that have not been treated uh, for protein stabilization. Um, also consider that we do have a protocol for protein stability that um, that's called a proactive protein stabilization. Uh, that will potentially uh, lower the amount of bentonite that you need to add. And in some cases, uh, we've seen some wines that don't even need to be protein stabilized when they use that protocol. So you can consider that uh, in addition to sort of a proactive approach for using Zenith if um, if you're interested in that, we did a, a webinar on it last year, so that's available online, and we have protocols for that available as well. Okay, we're getting we're getting close to the end of the questions here. Any stability issues with sweet wines? Uh, I see no difficulties with sweet wines. You just have to make sure that you do your testing, and if you're going to make any adjustments to the sugar level, uh, make those adjustments before submitting the wine for the panel. Robert Campbell is asking, what is the recommended time for KPA to rest on the wine before bottling? As soon as the KPA is mixed in the solution, you can uh, you can filter and bottle it. Again, there's not really a period of time that's required before uh, filtration and bottling, before final filtration and bottling, um, just as long as the KPA is homogenized in the wine and the wine um, has below two NTUs and is protein stable, um, as long as you meet those uh, criteria, the wine can be bottled as soon as you have it mixed in. And it's because it's low viscosity, uh, it's very easy to mix in the wine. So there's not the same waiting period as with some other uh, gums or CMCs. Um, you, don't, you don't have that with Zenith. What is your lab testing turnaround time? So uh, for the, the Zenith Uno panel, it is same day. Zenith color panel is longer because it's an actual physical six day uh, cold hold test. So the Zenith color is six days. Um, the um, Zenith Uno is going to be same day. KPA is not covered under the 24246 line item for finding any cold stabilization. So sp specific application to use it must be made to the TTB. Uh, no, the KPA is covered under the 24250, which means it's approved for domestic use. Uh, so that is uh, that's a different line item, and it does not need to be uh, it does not need, need to be a specific application um, from the TTB. It's it's approved by the TTB under the twenty four two fifty for domestic use. What is the shelf life for leftover product? Um, I've heard different recommendations on this. It's really dependent on the SO two level uh, and how much headspace is in the bottle and how you're storing it. Uh, but we recommend about four months after opening it to, to use the product. Um, I've heard some people using it after that uh, that that um, portion, but we recommend after about four months is, is how long you should consider uh, getting some new new KPA. Okay, that looks like I've reached the end of the question and answer portion. Again, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I hope that it was uh, helpful in terms of answering your questions on Zenith. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to email myself. Uh, you can also reach out to us by phone. Um, again, this is a recorded session. It's going to be available online for you uh, in just uh, probably a couple of days. Uh, I would encourage you, as soon as I end this webinar, there's going to be a survey uh, that, you're, that you're prompted and, and taken to. If you wouldn't mind just answering that survey to uh, let us know how we did. Uh, and then also we will be sending follow-up uh, PDFs in terms of the Stab of Wine project and also um, some of the um, presentation as well. So thank you everybody for coming. I hope that you all have a, a great weekend and we'll see you for the next webinar.